The cold card Q is a hardware device that allows you to secure your Bitcoin safely offline. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the Q, which is an iteration of a previous product from CoinKite, the same people who brought you the original cold card, as well as things like the tap signer, the block clock, and plenty of other Bitcoin goodies. We're going to be taking a look at a beginner's approach to the cold card queue. We're going to be setting up the device, using it to transact to and from, and practicing recovery so that you are confident in your Bitcoin storage and security practices. This is just the first in what I expect to be a series of videos covering the queue in all its iterations, depending on your preferences. I am Ben with the BTC Sessions. This is your daily session. HODL THE BITCOIN If you are sorting through some of the tutorials on the channel and you're finding that they're not quite cutting it and you need some additional hand-holding, setting up this or anything else Bitcoin related, you can reach out to me at my website, btcsessions.ca and book me for private one-on-one -on -one education sessions. Shout out to sponsors of the show, hodlhodl.com. If you're buying Bitcoin and your priorities include peer-to-peer -peer trading, instant self-custody and no KYC, this is an excellent place to get started. You can sign up with just an email address. Once you're in there, you can choose your currency payment method and an amount and can start viewing offers immediately. They also have peer-to-peer -peer lending where there's no rehypothecation. You can check them out at the links down below in the show notes. Now, of course, this show is sponsored by CoinKite, and that's uh, not the only reason I'm covering the queue. I'm very, very excited to get my hands on it and get playing here. Uh, but if you are interested after seeing this video and you want to pick up anything from them, including the queue, you can head over to coinkite.com. They've got tons of goodies. I've got basically everything from their website. But uh, if you want to grab anything, head there, coinkite.com. You can use code BTC Sessions, and that'll give you a nice discount at checkout. Uh, now, of course, backups are important as well, and the backup to your queue is no exception. I love what Seedor is doing. They have an awesome system for steel backups for your seed words. Uh, basically, it is a disk and capsule design. They've got starter sets with everything you need for one or two seeds to stamp it into solid steel, and this will protect the backup to your devices in steel so that they're protected from the elements, fire, water, corrosion, all of that. So check them out, cedor.io. There's links down below with all the best shipping options for you, depending on where you are in the world. And you can also check out my tutorial on them uh, on the channel. Now, nunchuck.io has you covered when it comes to multisig, aka, or more specifically, assisted multisig with their Honey Badger program. What this is, is they allow you to set up a multisig uh, vault on your mobile device using things like the tap signer, the cold card, and plenty of other hardware options. Once it's all set up, you have baked in inheritance planning so that your Bitcoin gets to your next of kin if anything should happen to you. And one of the best parts about it is it can all be done without KYC. You don't need to give up your private information to have it set up and working for you. And final shout out of the day to Start9, your sovereign computing solution. These guys have plug and play devices to host not only your Bitcoin software and stack, but your entire digital life. So these plug and play devices, uh, they allow you to run things like your Bitcoin core node, uh, lightning node, mempool.space, also files, passwords, photos, NOSTA relays and clients, even some AI tools. They've got a ton of awesome stuff that you can boot up and have running natively in your home. They have everything from entry-level devices all the way up to what I'm running, which is the Start9 Server Pure. If you want to check them out, head to start9.com. And if you're looking at that Pure, you can use my code BTC Sessions, the plus sign at the end, and get yourself 18% off. And with that, let's dive into today's tutorial. So let's start off with prerequisites. What will you need to know in order to successfully navigate this tutorial? Well, as I said in the intro, we're going to be starting from a bit of a beginner's perspective. However, there is some knowledge that will be an asset to you. Number one, where to obtain Bitcoin. And that's going to be different depending on where you are situated in the world. On my website, btcsessions.ca, if you go into the learn section, there will be some listings 
in terms of things available in Canada or the US and some international recommendations, but best to kind of look and see what is good and local to you just by doing a quick Google search on a line. Now, in terms of other tools that you may want to be privy to, having some experience with just basic Bitcoin transactions is a bit of an asset, but I won't say it's fully necessary to get through this tutorial. Also, a nice bonus to have is if you've ever tried Sparrow Wallet on your desktop computer, because we're going to be using it here with our cold card, but you don't have to have done it before in order to get through this tutorial. So long and the short of it is, know where to get some Bitcoin, and then follow along here. Uh, I will link to some other tutorials in the show notes down below. So if there's gaps in your knowledge, go check those out and that should fill you in. For those of you that are diving into this video and you want to see all of the additional bells and whistles and advanced features of the cold card queue, this will be coming. This is just the first in what I anticipate being a series of videos on the queue. Uh, I want to kind of segregate all the different ways to utilize it. So I'll be covering those in future videos. If you want to keep up with that, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit those notifications so that you can see everything else Q related as I release those. So let's address the number one thing you're going to need to know dealing with the Q is what does it do? What is the purpose of a device like this as a opposed to just a, a Bitcoin wallet app on your phone. Well, first you got to figure out exactly what does a Bitcoin wallet do? A Bitcoin wallet actually holds the keys to your money. It doesn't have hold the money itself. And this is because Bitcoin is effectively a global, a global ledger of who owns what. All of the money exists on said ledger. Your hardware wallet or any Bitcoin wallet on your phone basically has a key that allows you to unlock your funds on the global ledger. So it allows you to unlock certain money and move it wherever you see fit, as long as you have the keys to that particular money. With an app on your phone or an app on your computer, those apps, those keys are residing on your internet connected device, like your phone or your computer. And so that means the keys are only as secure as the device they are on. If your phone or your computer gets hacked and the keys are on those devices, Somebody can take those keys and anything that they unlock, namely your funds. When you're using something like a cold card queue, these devices, they house your keys in a secure manner in which they are never shared directly with an internet connected device. All they do is they take information and they give a digital signature to prove that you're allowed to move those funds. They basically unlock only the funds that you specify and then send them where you've specified them to be sent. It's not vulnerable to a digital attack. So nobody can just remotely hack your cold card because this device is not online. What happens if you lose this device? Well, what you're gonna see here is in the setup, we actually get a little bit of a backup and it comes in the form of English words, uh, typically 12 or 24 English words in a sequence. And what that actually is, it's, it's a copy of the key that is going to reside on this device. So you can think of it like a spare key. You might have a spare key to your house while well, you have a spare key to your Bitcoin as well. One key on this device and one key backed up typically written on paper or etched in steel. There's plenty of options for that as well, but kept securely and usually separately from the hardware device itself. So what happens is if this device breaks or you lose it or something bad happens to it, those words are a literal copy of the key and you can recover all of your funds with those words, either by getting a new device and inputting those words to recover or taking those words to any other device or any other even software wallet and plunking them in, that will regain access to your funds. The most important thing when it comes to your backups, your seed phrase as it's known, is that you do not keep it in a digital form. So you don't want to jot this down in notes on your phone. You don't want to save it in the cloud. You don't want to do anything like that. You want a physical form so that is not remotely accessible. So if your cloud gets hacked, you're not giving up the keys to your life savings in the process. As we go through the backup process when we're initially setting things up, please keep those words secure. But again, 
This houses a key to your money and your words are gonna be a spare key. So that is the function of this device and that is what we are accomplishing today. A couple other side notes, uh, you'll see all about how to send and receive transactions and you'll see all about how to set up uh, your Sparrow Wallet. How does Sparrow Wallet play into this? It is an app on your computer that you're gonna download and it allows you to see your balance. It allows you to add to your balance, but in, in order to send money anywhere else, you're gonna require the key to unlock those funds. So that's how I want you to think about everything we're doing today. With that, let's dive into the setup of your cold card queue. Okay, so we're starting here with a fresh cold card queue. Uh, this one has not been booted on yet, but I have put in three AAA batteries in the back. That's how we're going to be powering it. You could uh, potentially power it uh, from the USB-C at the bottom here. Uh, but either way, that's how we're going to be operating this thing today. And to power it on, there's a power button just over on the top left hand side. We're just going to press that. And here we go. Okay, so it starts off by using this product. You are accepting our terms of sale and use. Read the full document at, and it gives you a URL you can go to. Press enter to accept the terms and continue. We'll just hit the enter button. By the way, your navigation is up and down here in the middle and side to side uh, in the middle as well, left to right. But we're going to hit enter here. All right, your new cold card should have arrived sealed in a bag with the above number. Please Take a moment to confirm. This is just making sure that it's shipped from the same place. It hasn't been tampered with, so on and so forth. And my bag does indeed have the same number listed above. Okay, so now we're going to choose a pin code. That's the first thing that you typically do on a regular cold card mark four. Same thing here. So I'm going to hit enter on choose pin code. Now, just some quick clarification on how this pin is going to work. There's going to be two parts. There's a prefix and a suffix or a beginning and an end. Each part of your pin will constitute between two and six digits in numerical form. So an example pin might be one, two, three, four, five, six, followed by one, two, three, four, five, six. In between these two pieces, you're going to have something called your anti-phishing words. And when you put in the prefix or the beginning of your pin, you will be presented with these words. And if they are correct and they're the same ones every single time, you then put in the rest of your pin. If they are incorrect, as in if they are incorrect after you've already set up your pin and they show differently next time, what that denotes is either number one, you've incorrectly put in the beginning of your pin, or number two, somebody has tampered with your device. In most cases, it will be the first one, but if you repeatedly put in the beginning of your pin, either you've totally forgotten it if you're getting the wrong words, or somebody has played with your device. So that is the purpose of the anti-phishing words. Prefix, words, suffix. That's the breakdown. Let's set it up. Okay, we're going to go ahead and we're going to hit enter. Warning, there's absolutely no way to reset a pin. And it wants to make sure you read this down at the bottom. It will say press six to prove you read this message. I'm going to press six and off we go. So first part of the pin, I'm going to do a really basic one for this video. We're just going to do one, two, three, four, five, six for both parts of the pin. And I'll hit enter. These are my anti phishing words listed below setup and sibling. And I'll put in the second part of the pin Hit enter. And now it's asking me to confirm. So put in the first part of your pin again, and we get the same anti-vision words. Now we put in the next part. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'll hit enter. And it's saving. If you had incorrectly entered it, it would give you an error message. So we know that our pin is set up, and this will now be the pin for the device. If we ever want to change it, we can do that after the fact. Uh, but it is now currently as we've set it. All right, so we are now bumped to our main screen here. We have a pin allocated to the device, but we don't yet have any keys residing on this device. We need to create some. So we have a menu in front of us, new seed words, import existing, advanced, and settings. We're going to choose new seed words and hit enter. Now it does give you some options here, 12, 24 words, or 12 and 24 words with adding dice rolls. 
The dice roll function serves to add additional randomness into your words, which if you're unsure that's a positive thing, you can do it if you like. We're not going to be doing that today in terms of the difference between 12 and 24. Uh, technically speaking, obviously it is easier to guess a 12 word phrase over a 24 word phrase, but the likelihood of guessing even a 12 word phrase out of the 2048 possible words there could be for each iteration and getting that correct and guessing anybody's seed phrase for a Bitcoin wallet is so infinitesimally small, I can't even truly express it. It's kind of like trying to find a singular grain of sand in the Milky Way galaxy. It's just not going to happen. So don't feel bad if you choose 12. I'm going to do a 12 word phrase today for this example. Uh, this will now generate my seed phrase randomly through the software in the cold card queue. I now see 12 words entered in front of me right now. I am going to jot these down on a piece of paper and then I'm going to go through, double check them, and then do, as it states here, a skill testing question, series of questions to make sure that I've actually truly written them down. So please write them down, double check them, and then we'll be back momentarily. After writing them all down, I'm going to hit enter and it's going to ask me systematically one by one, what is word number and insert number here? And it's going to do them randomly as well. So for instance, here it says word number eight is, and it gives me three options. I'm looking at my list here and I can see that word number eight was arm. And so in this list, I can see it's the second option. So I'm going to hit number two and we'll go all the way through until I've done all 12 words. After a short applying screen, after having answered all 12 words correctly, we'll see our welcome screen. Your cold card has now been configured for the best security practices with a bunch of different features currently disabled. So the USB, the NFC, and the virtual disk, all different options that you can use with your cold card are currently disabled. And if we scroll down, it says you can change these under settings, hardware on and off. So we will look on that depending on how we intend to use the cold card today. So I'll just hit enter and we're bumped to our main screen. And this is going to be your main screen, your default screen. Every time you turn on the cold card and put in your pin, you'll see ready to sign up at the top and all of your subsequent menu items down below. So today we are doing a very basic way, an easy way of using the cold card queue. And that is going to be wired directly into your computer using Sparrow Wallet. And so first what we're going to do, we're going to download Sparrow Wallet at SparrowWallet.com. That'll be linked in the show notes. And just on the main screen, when you get there, there's a download button up in the top right. You are then going to figure out which one is best for you. I am on a Mac, but there is two different options there. So if you're unsure whether you're Intel or M1, M2, just go up to the top left-hand side of your Mac, hit about this Mac, and it will bring up a little screen like this. I can see right up here, it says M1. Yours, if it's a newer model, it might be M3, but the same thing applies here. Um, otherwise it might say Intel. And so that will let you know which one of these you need. If you're on windows, I would say just get the installer, download it, double click it. It'll take th you through the basic steps of installing a program on your computer. So I'm going to click on this one here. It will enter into my downloads. Once it's done, I'm going to simply open up the file that was downloaded. So there we go. So I'm going to click on that. I'm going to open it up and that pops up this little screen here. And if you are uncertain what to do here, you literally grab the Sparrow logo, you drag it into applications and let go. Now, I already have it installed, so I don't need to go ahead and do this, but you drag it over, you let go, it will install it into your applications. And then at that point, you can open up a finder window, go to your applications and look for Sparrow and double click it to open it up, which I'll do now. And you will get a very basic, and I'll close my browser here, you'll get a very basic screen here. There will be an intro screen for Sparrow Wallet that walks you through a number of things. Um, you can just kind of hit the blue buttons and follow through all the way through. 
uh, to get things set up there. The one thing you will want to do if you're brand new to Sparrow Wallet is you're going to go to, and it's different in Mac, but Sparrow Settings, or if you're in uh, Windows, it'll probably be under File Settings or perhaps Preferences, I might say. But either way, you're finding the settings and you're getting into Server is what you're looking for. You're going to edit the existing connection. You will just be choosing a public server unless you have your own node running. I'm assuming not at the moment if you're doing the the kind of getting started with your cold card and that's okay. So all you're going to do is you're just going to hit test connection. It'll take a second and this is in the setup as well. Uh, if you go through the setup screens, it'll give you the option to connect to a public server. That's what you're going to be doing. And after a moment, you should get a little green check mark here and then you can hit the close button. And so that little green check mark looks just like this. And at that point, you can hit close. You'll see this little button down in the bottom right, turn yellow and go off to the right. And it'll say connected and whatever node you had chosen to connect to will be listed there. Um, other than that, you're going to leave this put for the time being. And we're going to jump over to our cold card and get it plugged into our computer. Now, the first thing we need to do with the cold card before we can use it plugged into the computer is we need to go all the way down to settings and hit enter. And then we need to go to hardware on slash off. And we saw this earlier. We're going to hit enter and we're going to enable the USB port at the top. So hit enter, go to default on, hit enter, and that's all good. So we're just going to hit the cancel button to get back to our main screen. Cancel, cancel. And there we are back to the main screen. So we're just recentering ourselves. Our main screen always starts with ready to sign. And this is kind of our central hub for navigation of our cold card. Now, at this point, we can and we could have done it earlier, but we can plug our uh, our cold card into our computer. Any uh, uh, USB-C. Uh, so this is a USB-C port at the bottom of the cold card. Um, any USB-C cable that is capable of data transfer will work just fine for your computer. Um, just be aware the magnetic ones, uh, those ones do not transmit data. So if you're trying to do the little magnetic dongle and you're trying to actually connect to your computer and you're having trouble, that's why, because those ones are for power only, not for data. This one is for data, okay? So I'm gonna plug it in to the bottom of the cold card and that's pretty much it. We're, we're good to go. And now we can jump to our computer and utilize the cold card to have it viewable in Sparrow Wallet. All right, so we've got Sparrow Wallet on our computer. We've got our cold card plugged in. What we're going to do is in Sparrow, we're going to go to File, New Wallet, and we're going to give it a name. I'm just going to, for simplicity's sake, call this one Q. And the general rule for Sparrow throughout this entire tutorial will be when in doubt, hit the blue button. That is going to be your navigation go to unless otherwise specified. So I'm going to hit the blue button for create wallet. And this is a scary looking screen, but not to worry. You don't need to know too much about what's in front of you. All you need to know is you have a connected hardware wallet and that's what we want to use. We've connected it to the computer. So we're going to hit the connected hardware wallet button. And then we're going to hit the blue scan button. This will look for the cold card. It sees it. And I can now say import key store. And that's going to grab data from the cold card that enables you to see the balance and add to the balance. And if you have the cold card handy to spend from the balance, this then imports a whole bunch of different information here. It fills it in again. You don't need to know too much about this stuff right now. Just know that it got the necessary data from your cold card and we can now hit the blue apply button in the bottom right. This password that it's asking you if you want to set up, this one has nothing to do with spending. It's more so if you are concerned that somebody might get on your computer and open up Sparrow and just see your balance. Remember, they won't be able to spend from it unless they have the cold card and the pin. Uh, if you want to protect just the balance, just being able to see it, then you can add a password. For this tutorial, I will bypass this and say no password. And with that, you'll notice that the entire left side of the screen turns blue. All of these buttons are now available, clickable, and that means we're basically set up. So let's get our bearings and see where we are. 
So starting from this main screen, let's go to kind of what will end up being our main hub of, of Sparrow. We're going to click on transactions. And this is your home screen. So what you're going to see here is you're going to see your balance in sats up top, uh, which of course right now is zero. Then there's something below it that says mempool. That is basically saying how much of your balance, your total balance, how much of that is a brand new transaction that is waiting to be confirmed and will eventually confirm. So if I had, say, I don't know, 50 million sats listed in the balance and it had 25 million sats listed in the mempool, that means that half of my 50 million sats are new transactions waiting to be confirmed. Okay. Now, down below, we also see transactions. There's a counter. We have zero right now. And once we do start receiving transactions, they will be listed here in this uh, field, this white field here, and they will have date, label, value, balance, all that kind of stuff listed beside it. We'll also get a neat little graph of our balance over time once we start having one. Uh, down the left hand side, the two main things you're going to be utilizing is the send screen and the receive screen, and we will get to those once we start using them. Uh, there is also an address screen that shows you all of your receive addresses or the first 20 or so, um, and then your change addresses. And so uh, without getting too deep into it, every time you receive a new transaction, it will pull a new receive address for you. You can, there's no danger of losing funds if you send to the same address more than once, but it's not great for privacy. So just let Sparrow do its thing. Every time you receive a transaction, it'll give you a new receive address. Good idea to use those. And then UTXOs without getting too detailed about it. Basically, Bitcoin works in a way, not like a bank account where it's just a balance. It's more like cash in your wallet. So every time you receive a transaction, it's actually a chunk of Bitcoin sitting in your wallet. And so this would be like looking into your wallet and seeing all of your fives, tens, twenties, fifties, hundreds, whatever. You would be able to see all the coins, the separate coins sitting in your wallet from this screen may not be super relevant to you yet, but later on it may be of use as you be, uh, as you level up your Bitcoining game. Nonetheless, transactions, send, receive, those are going to be your main screens that you deal with in Sparrow. All right, so the first thing we want to do is we want to receive a transaction to our cold card. And in Sparrow, as you may have guessed, we're going to go to the receive screen over on the left here. And the receive screen is pretty simple. You don't need to know about all this junk kind of down in the bottom section, just the top section. So up top, you're going to see an address uh, and odds are yours will start with BC1. And this is all the information anybody needs to send you Bitcoin. It can be copied by simply clicking on the copy button. It is also represented off to the side by a QR code. And anybody that was present that had, say, a phone wallet or something could scan that QR code and it would just give them the same address information so they knew where to send money. And then secondly, you have a label. And the best practice uh, when using this is to type in where is this money coming from, from an exchange, from a person, whoever it is. And this is only kept internally in Sparrow for your own records. It's not put on the Bitcoin blockchain. Nobody else can see this. Just you in Sparrow wallet. All right. Um, now, where you're sending Bitcoin from is going to vary depending on what you're doing. But odds are you're probably obtaining Bitcoin from some source like uh, an online exchange. And so the example I have here today, I have Bull Bitcoin. This is a Canadian Bitcoin exchange, but I just wanted to kind of show the general idea. So when you go to purchase Bitcoin on any exchange, there's going to be a part where you either withdraw or maybe during the actual purchase, it asks you for a Bitcoin address and then it will send your funds to said address on Bull Bitcoin. Uh, I'm basically on my buy Bitcoin sc uh, screen here. I just scroll down and it says, hey, how much are you spending? I have $200 in my account, Canadian dollars in my account right now. Uh, it gives me the option to withdraw through various means. I'm doing a regular Bitcoin transaction and it says, hey, what's your uh, Bitcoin address? And so I'm going to paste in the address I just copied and I can cross check it. It's a good idea to check the first few digits and the last few digits. If I jump back over to Sparrow, I can see that those are the same. 
So that all looks good to me. And uh, I can also enter a memo here. Now, over in Sparrow, I'm going to say where this came from. So I'm just going to type bull, and that's, that's enough for me. Okay. So over here in Bull Bitcoin, uh, that all looks good to me. I'm just going to hit create by order. And so it says, look, we will send this amount of Bitcoin to this Bitcoin address. Does that look good to you? There's a confirm button. I'm going to hit confirm and it will give me a receipt. And it says, hey, this is going to be sent out around this time. A lot of exchanges, there'll be a little bit of a delay because they batch a whole bunch of withdrawals together at the same time. This may or may not be the case for your exchange, but nonetheless, uh, same general idea. You'll have an exchange that asks you for a receiving address and they will send it out to it at the appropriate time. So all you're waiting for now is in Sparrow, you will have a pop-up notification that comes that says you have a new incoming transaction and this screen will recycle into a new address. In fact, you don't even need to stay on this screen. You can just go straight to transactions. And when your transaction comes through, you will see a balance pop up here. You'll see a new transaction down below and you'll see the beginning of hopefully your chart that goes up only as you begin to accumulate Bitcoin. So we'll be back when that happens. I can just minimize or get rid of my exchange. Don't need to have that up and open anymore. See you momentarily. It's also worth noting that here on the cold card, you can verify your receiving addresses that you see in Sparrow with your device itself. So if you're curious about how to do that, you can scroll down to Address Explorer and hit Enter. Uh, and it says, hey, this is going to give you the first payment address produced by various common wallet systems. Uh, and you can either press four to start or you can press six to hide this message forever. OK, uh, so I'll, I'll just press four for now, and this is going to bring up different address types that you can generate. There are different types of Bitcoin receiving addresses. Uh, there's classic. Uh, this one's called wrapped SegWit and this one's called SegWit. And I can see here this address. And actually, if I were to uh, bring up and I'll do this side by side. But if I were to bring up my screen here and go to my receive address, I can see that the last few digits of that first address listed, because it's the, the very first receiving address, they do line up with the same one that I have here in Sparrow. And if I were to go into this section here and hit enter, it will give me a list of addresses uh, and I can scroll down and I can see all these addresses in a row there. And I can actually in Sparrow, and sorry for the transitions back and forth here, but I can go to my address list and I can cross verify this list here with what is on my cold card if I am worried about them not lining up. So that's just a little bonus. Uh, I'll say that you don't necessarily have to be doing that every time, but there is a degree of trust if you just kind of leave it to Sparrow, both platforms um, you are able to go and audit the code and make sure that it's doing what they're saying they're doing. Um, so there are eyeballs on that code. But if you don't trust that and you want to tr verify it yourself, then you're welcome to. All right. So it's some time later and we did receive that transaction. Uh, I wasn't at my computer recording when the transaction came in. But just so you know, there will be a notification that pops up usually in the top right hand corner of your screen that lets you know there's an incoming transaction. Uh, you will then see reflected in the balance up here, which we do here. Uh, the reason for the discrepancy in the dollar amount is because this uh, wallet is denominated in US dollars. So yes, the Canadian dollar is that bad. Uh, but nonetheless, it was 200 Canadian dollars or 145 American. Uh, but we got 279,200 sats. And um, uh, just as a side note, those of you new to Bitcoin, there are 100 million sats in one Bitcoin. Most people nowadays refer to the amount of sats that they're receiving. Um, so, yeah, uh, we also see mempool is now at zero. That means that when we first received this transaction, it would have also said 279,200 in the mempool, meaning that it was not yet fully officially confirmed. It was on its way to being confirmed. Um, and confirmed just means that it's 
more or less irreversible. And now in our uh, down below in this little um, section here, we can see a transaction and it has the label bull that we put on before, it has a value, and then it has a total balance off to the side. Those are one and the same because we don't have other transactions. And then it has a date added to uh, when we received it. So we've now successfully received a transaction um, by our receive screen, but how do we send out of Sparrow if we wanted to do so with our cold card? Well, we're gonna do that next. Okay, so we are now going to be sending a transaction out of Sparrow, obviously, with the help of our cold card. Now, this is the, other than initially setting up your wallet, this is the only real operation that you need your cold card for. You can receive transactions to and audit the balance of your cold card without ever having to plug the thing in. But to spend, again, you can think of this as the key to unlock your money and send it wherever you see fit. So that's how we are treating it now. It is plugged in. I still have to put in the pin, but we're going to get ourselves started first. So effectively what you're going to do is you on Sparrow are going to set up what you want to do first, and then you will approve it with the cold card. You'll give the signature or you'll unlock the funds when you're ready. So we're going to go over on the left to our send screen. And so it asks you a number of things. Where do you want to pay to? What label do you want to give it? AKA, what, what are you going to write in for your own records? What amount do you want to send? And then what fee are you going to attach to your transaction? And uh, this fee has to do with, number one, how busy the network is. Number two, how much data your transaction takes up. Not how much you're sending, but how much data. And uh, number three, your preference of how quickly you'd like the transaction to go through based on those conditions. And it's a simple slider back and forth. Uh, and then we'll go on from there. So let's first say, where do we want to pay to? Now you can do different things here. If somebody were to message you or um, email you an address, you can simply paste it into this field and that's all you need. However, if you are in front of your computer and you have perhaps a phone wallet or whatever, and you want to scan a QR code, you can do the same. So I've got a, uh, a camera or rather a QR code on my phone ready. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to hit this little icon here, the camera icon. That's going to open up my webcam. So there you can see it. And I'm just going to move it close. And that should, yeah, that captured everything. I'm just taking a quick peek on my phone and comparing the last and first few digits and it looks good to me. So that is great. Uh, then I'm gonna type in the destination for my own records. Uh, I'm using something called Aqua Wallet in this instance. I have a video on it. Maybe I'll include that in the show notes down below. And finally, an amount. You can set your amount in sats. Remember, 100 million sats per Bitcoin uh, or... If you prefer to deal in decimals or if it's a large amount, you can select BTC. Either way, same thing. Uh, or if you want to clear out the entire balance, there is a max button off to the side. I am going to send out the entire amount this time. I'm going to hit max. It auto fills it and then it adjusts for the fee that I'm going to be paying to send this. Now let's take a look at that fee range. So just a quick reminder, address, label of where you're sending it and the amount you'd like to send. The fee is really just a simple slider. You're gonna slide it back and forth. And what you'll notice is in this little section here, it will let you know what fee will be high priority, medium priority, or low, okay? So high priority means that you anticipate it getting in to the next batch of transactions, which on average is every 10 minutes, things get fully confirmed. If you're going medium or low, it will take a little bit longer depending on how far you deviate from that range. Take note that if you slide this up too high, it will let you know. It'll say, hey, you're, you're overpaying here. You can bump this down. And on the other end, if you start going lower, it'll say, well, you can try this and then you can replace it because it allows you to bump fees later. 
And if you go super low, it'll let you know, hey, this transaction will likely never go through um, or it could be in a, a really long period of time. And it may just bump back to your own wallet, which is what happens if your transaction really never gets picked up by miners. Uh, it will just revert back to the wallet it came from. So it does give you those warnings. For this instance, we'll set a high priority one, which is going to cost me around 92 cents at the time or 1,767 sats. Um, finally, down below here, this just kind of shows you the flow of where, where your transaction is going. It's saying, hey, you're taking this one piece of Bitcoin. You are sending it primarily to this Aqua wallet that you've specified. And then here's the fee splitting off from that going to the miners. And from here on in, blue buttons for the next little bit. As I advised before, when in doubt, hit the blue button. We're going to hit create transaction. This gives us a summary. Finalize. And now, now the blue button again is to sign. And this will allow us to sign with our cold card. But we have to be ready with our cold card in the meantime. So we need to make sure that we've put in our pin. Okay. So we'll just do that right now. Okay. So we are logged in, ready to go. So we will now look at it uh, side by side here and we'll zoom in on the cold card when it's time to do anything. Uh, so in Sparrow, we're just going to hit the blue button again, sign. There's an option to scan. So it'll scan for any connected hardware wallets. It sees the cold card and it's unlocked. So we're going to hit the blue sign button. And this will now prompt us on the cold card to approve the transaction. So here on the cold card, it says, hey, is this OK to send? You're sending this much Bitcoin. And here you can see it as a decimal as opposed to in sats to the following address, which I'm cross comparing on Sparrow and I see it's correct. And the, your network fees are 1,767 sats. Does that look good to you? Um, it does give some additional information but it says basically press enter to approve and sign or cancel to abort i'm going to go ahead i'm going to hit enter and maybe what i'll do is i'll show both but i'm hitting the enter button on my cold card right now so now it bumps me back to my main screen on my cold card and i can see in sparrow I now have the signature, that little bar fills all the way across. I've got my signature for my cold card. I've approved it. Nobody is aware of it yet. What we need to do is hit that final blue button broadcast and that sends off your transaction to the entire Bitcoin network. So everyone's aware, hey, these funds are now moving somewhere else. So we'll do that right now. And there we go. And you can see that little notification in the top right hand corner. That's much like when you're receiving a transaction, you'll see something similar. Uh, and now we have successfully sent off a transaction to our wallet. And just to show, uh, here's my Aqua wallet and it does indeed have a pending transaction. I'll just zoom in on it. So there we go. I've got a pending transaction for uh, that amount of sats, 277,000 sats. And here it is on Sparrow Wallet. And every time you're working on a transaction like this, setting up what you want to do, it again will open up its own tab for what you've been working on for that transaction. Uh, and so once you've sent it off, you can close that tab by hitting the little X that will bump you back to your send screen. This will have blanked out because we already uh, sent off everything we needed to. It gives us a clean slate. If we go up to transactions in the top left, we will now see a new transaction listed above uh, taking those 279,000 sats out of our wallet and sending it on to its new destination. You'll notice now that it says unconfirmed. And so in roughly 10 minutes, that will show as confirmed because we did do a high priority fee. And so that will be updated momentarily. And there we see it right there. So we see, again, there's our confirmation just popped up. And we can now see that this is now confirmed. Nothing in the mempool, anything like that. So there we go. We've now sent off a transaction with our cold card. All right. So this is a very important part of 
using your cold card or any hardware device for that matter is knowing how to recover in the event of hardware failure, aka what if you lose this device or what if you break it and you can no longer access it and you need to recover your funds? Well, that's where your seed phrase comes in, those 12 or 24 words that you wrote down at the beginning of this video. And I want you to follow along and go through this recovery process with me so that you have the peace of mind of knowing you can do this when it is a stressful time, when you encounter something like this at some point in the future, you're going to want to know that you've already done this and you know it works. So here's what we're going to do right now. We're going to go and we're going to wipe this device. We're going to get rid of the keys to your money off of this device. So it's more or less blank and it won't fully be blank because the pin code will still be here, but the keys will be gone and we'll only have the written ones for us to access our funds if there were funds in the wallet. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go down to advanced slash tools and hit enter. Then we're gonna go all the way down to that bottom where it says danger zone. And we're gonna hit enter there. So next we're gonna go to seed functions and we're gonna go to the ominous destroy seed. We're gonna enter. It says, are you sure? Wipe the seed words and reset the wallet. All funds will be lost. You better have a backup of the seed words. We're going to hit enter. Are you really sure though? This action will certainly cause you to lose all funds associated with this wallet unless you have a backup of the seed words and know how to import them in a new wallet. Press 4 to prove you read the end of this message and accept all the consequences. Here we go. 4. Clearing. Verifying. There we go. Bumped back to the main screen. Let's put in our pin and see what happens. All right, so we're now on that original screen we saw after we first set up our pin. So we are basically back to scratch. We don't have any keys on this device. One thing I'll note as well, if you did break your device and you've replaced it and you're doing a new device and setting it up, it will uh, prompt you to set up a pin first, as we did the first time. But note that the anti-phishing words will be new, even though your pin is the same. Even if you use the same pin, there'll be new anti-phishing words because it also has to do with which device you're using. Okay, so don't freak out if you see different anti-phishing words on a new device. It's supposed to be that way. So anyways... Um, we're going to use, instead of new seed words, we're going to choose import existing. So we're going to go there. We're going to hit enter. It says, how many words do you have? Uh, 12, 18, 24, and it gives us some other options here. But we're going to be doing our 12-word phrase that we used before, unless you did something different. And now you get to enter in the seed words as you had them before using the keypad. So we'll do that and continue on from there. So I do want to show you really quick as you begin to type in, my first word is radio. As I begin to type in, it gives me what the next key could possibly be. And that's because there's a limited number of words that could possibly be part of a seed phrase. There are 2,048 2, possible words that could be here. So you can see that it's saying your next key is either going to be an A or an I. Well, it's radio. As soon as I type that, it only needs the first four digits of any word to know what the entire word is going to be. So my next word is toilet. So I should only have to type in T-O-I-L and then it should be done. T-O-I. And even some in some cases, you need even less. Uh, so we're going to go through that for the entire phrase until we get to the end. All right, so once you've typed in your full phrase, if you've done it correctly, it should say valid words, press enter. So I'll do that now. All right, your cold card has been configured for the best security practices, and it does uh, basically wipe all my settings. So um, my USB is currently disabled, uh, and it says that, hey, you can change these under settings, hardware on and off. Um, we are going to go do that because we need access to this on the computer. Uh, so we'll go down to settings, hardware on and off, and we'll go to USB and we'll turn it on. Okay. We'll hit cancel to get back to the main screen. 
and there we go. Now, let's also say that perhaps you, you just had a, a big disaster and you don't have access to the same computer that you used to be on, but you need to import your uh, wallet. You can, you can do that as well. And so this would apply maybe in some instances you just deleted Sparrow or something like that, or you have a new computer and you need to access the same cold card account that you were using before. This would be your flow here. So we'll jump onto the computer here. And uh, as before, you may have some, you may have to download Sparrow and do some setting stuff there uh, as we did at the beginning of this video, but you're going to go through the same flow, file, new wallet. Um, just because this is the same computer, I'm going to say Q1 this time, we'll call it, and we'll hit create wallet. We're going to say connected hardware wallet. We're going to scan for it. We're going to hit import key store because it sees the cold card. And that should pull all the information that we need. Okay, so it pulls all this information here. I'm going to hit apply. We'll say no password as we did before. And then we'll jump back up to transactions. And hey, look, a, we can see our history of transactions. We can see our balance. If there was a balance before, it would still be there. And uh, we have full access to our funds as we did before. So that is your flow if you lost everything, or you could piecemeal it off if you just lost Sparrow, or if you just lost your cold card, you still have access. Now, there's one other thing I want to show really quick, and that is if you accidentally close this little tab here, and you get back to this main Sparrow screen, don't freak out. Don't worry. You still have access. You're just going to go file, open wallet. Now I've got a whole mess of wallets because I do a lot of tutorials and everything. Uh, but let's open that Q1 that I just created. There's the old one, by the way, Q. Uh, but we'll hit open and that gets us right back to our main screen and we have access to everything again. Last thing I want to touch on here is just resetting your pin. If you want to change the existing pin and you do need to remember the existing pin to, the, to do this. You get yourself logged in. You're going to scroll all the way down to settings. You're going to choose login settings. And then top option is change your main pin. Uh, it says you will be changing the main pin to be used to unlock your cold card. There's absolutely no way to recover a fo forgotten pin. Write it down. We'll hit enter. Old main pin asks what was your original pin. So you're going to put that in. You'll hit enter. It will show you your anti phishing words. We'll put in the second or the suffix and we'll hit enter. And now it asks what is your new pin going to be? So I'm just going to do one, two, three, four as an example. It gives me two new anti phishing words and I'll put one, two, three, Four again as another example, we'll hit enter and it's going to ask you to do it one more time to confirm. Enter, saving pin, and there we go. Bumped back, we can just hit cancel to get back to the main screen. Our new pin has been instituted, the old one is now gone. So let's chat final thoughts on the queue. What do I think about it? What, am, what are my key takeaways? Well, number one, while the queue does pack a ton of new features and a, a lot of bells and whistles, as we kind of covered today, it can be used in a more simple method, right? You can simply plug it in, you know, generate your, your seed phrase and just send and receive transactions. and push off uh, some of the advanced features until later. And that's totally okay. And that was the, the tactic we took today. Um, there's plenty to cover in the advanced stuff on the queue. And again, we'll be covering those in subsequent videos. Now, the things that we did touch on today that I think are worth me uh, mentioning, number one, the addition of a keyboard on this thing makes everything much more accessible. And what I mean is dealing with the cold card Mark IV, navigating, well, I love my cold card Mark IV. I've got to say having a keyboard uh, on recovery in particular is, is much welcomed because doing the, the recovery with the 12-word phrase it was so much quicker than having to kind of scroll through the characters very happy about that. The other thing that I really noticed uh, in making this first video here is that 
the larger screen size allows or makes those um, menus, some of which can have quite a few options, it makes them a lot more accessible because you can see where things are without having to scroll through to the bottom and realize you're in the wrong menu and then go back. Um, and then also in regards to just the general navigation and the button pushing and everything, um, I've actually found it a lot more responsive than the original Mark IV. Like you, you sometimes you you might hit a button on the original cold card and it might not respond. You got to press a little firmer. Whereas on this, the buttons are quite responsive. They do actually respond to every every click. So um, that's also uh, another step up. The other nice thing that I like about this in regards to things that we've we covered today is the batteries so you can have the batteries plunked in here or you can have it plugged into a power source either way you have access to using this you don't have to have batteries in it you can just plug it in um, but having batteries accessible and being able to go through that entire setup without plugging it into a computer is possible i can power it on and utilize it however i see fit and that will also play into some of the future videos where you may not even be plugging it into a computer at all and just be using it entirely separately. So yeah, the, the battery um, added functionality there is nice having it fully on its own when it can be or when it needs to be. So I'm curious about your thoughts. Please let me know in the comments down below what you thought of the Q uh, and its kind of most basic functionality as we cover today and what you're looking forward to seeing in subsequent videos. What features would you like me to cover on the cold card queue? I look forward to hearing from you all. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Please do remember to like, subscribe, share all those things. They help a ton getting this content in front of more eyeballs. If you want to help the show in another way, you can hit up the previously mentioned sponsors. They are all in the show notes down below. And then finally, if you do need some extra hand holding, you've been sorting through the tutorials and you just need that one on one touch, you can reach out to me at my website, btcsessions.ca and book me for one on one private education sessions. You can also sign up for my newsletter where every week I send out a summary of all of the content that has gone out. Uh, with that, I am out. Have yourselves a wonderful day or evening, wherever you may be, and I'll see you guys next time for your daily session. Huddle the Bitcoin.